Good evening. I know it has been quite a while since I've made a video and I waited because the ongoing situation in the Ukraine uh, with the Russian war, Ukraine, the Russian war, uh, has really developed into a war of attrition more so than anything else. And I think I had mentioned this in my last video. And uh, because a war of attrition, it's like World War I, the stagnant funds they had in uh, France, Germany, Belgium, that whole area over there, turned into a material war, more so than anything else. And I want to get to this in a minute. Um, as I had said earlier in my, I think in my channel info, I wrote in there that this channel or my videos are not supposed to be, I don't want to make them about my family. And um, anyway, since I think March, the beginning of March, I have worked together with a friend of mine. His name is Richard Brook. And Richard has a family blog post for the Brook family. And he just does an excellent job with this stuff. If you're interested in genealogy, in European history, and uh, Jewish European history, then you really need to look at this. And in the 1930s, uh, Richard's relatives or a relative did some work for one of my ancestors, uh, cataloging artwork, evaluating, appraising, you know, these uh, artworks, paintings, couple plates, and, and God knows what else they looked at. And Richard wrote in the course of this four blog posts up of the interaction between his family and my family. I will put the links to these four blog posts in the description of this video. And uh, then you can go to Richard's website and you can take a look at this and read it. They're very long. Uh, so if you have a difficulty reading more than one paragraph, and there, uh, then you may want to take a little bit of time out and do it piecemeal. We put some pictures in there. I opened up our archives and Richard looked in his archives. So there's some interesting pictures there to see too. And uh, you can then get to know our history a little bit better of how things unfolded since about 1830 until about 1945. That is roughly the time period we're covering in these four blog posts. And uh, like I said, Richard is a retired archeologist and it looks like it, he majored in English. So the English is college level, advanced college level. So if you're a foreign viewer and you're not too familiar with English as second, a second or third language, you may also wanna take your time or you wanna use a website translator like with google you can click on this thing or safari uh, on the iphones they have the um, you know translator built in and then you can translate that into your native language and it may help you a little bit to read through the stuff in the case you get stuck the other thing is what i wanted to bring up before we're going to get to this uh russian ukrainian war um in a minute here was I'm watching two ladies, Russian ladies, YouTubers, who present Russia, since they live there, in English. And I have been watching them long before that war ever started. And one of them is Svetlana, and Svetlana posted a video today. And it was kind of uh, sad to see that the um, sanctions are now impacting regular people to the extent as they do is because she can now no longer receive her payments from YouTube. Uh, you know, I have another channel, my car channel, and I have 2000 subscribers there. So I'm qualified to make some money. And just to give you an idea, on an average of 10,000, 15,000 views, that pays us here in the United States about $100 per month. No, not even that much, 35 bucks, 40 bucks a month or something like this. 
I get every three months, I get like $110 or something like this because uh, Google waits until you have accumulated $100 in there. So the other channel I have, my car channel, was primarily just for the Mercedes-Benz community, which has the W126 S-Class, um, you know, the old cars, and they needed to do repairs. It was just a public community service where I posted all of my repairs on there. And it has become a, a quite popular channel among most people who are serious about fixing their cars. And Svetlana is now in a position where she said today in her video that she cannot get the $1,000 which have accumulated now in her account since uh, I think February. That's when she was no longer able to receive this. And the problem now is that the intermediary banks, which is, I think she said, JP Chase Morgan, uh, Reif Eisenbank, and I forgot the other one. There was a third bank, uh, two Americans, one German bank with the intermediaries, which conduct the SWIFT transfers on behalf of the Russian banks. And they no longer can do this. So this means if you have money coming in from through the SWIFT system, which is our banking system in the United States primarily, and not so much Europe, but the United States, then it will be very difficult to receive it. Uh, it's virtually impossible at this point because the intermediary banks no longer pass these incoming SWIFT payments for a person on to the final destination, to the consumer bank, actually, where you would have your bank account. And I saw this coming last year um, when they announced the sanctions and how they were structured and everything. Is And I said this before in my videos that, uh, you know, I thought there were certain times it was good to leave Russia if you're male, 18 years and older, uh, you know, because of the draft situation and God knows how crazy that's going to get to begin with, especially now after the Wagner mutiny over there. That's another thing we get into a little bit later with this whole Wagner thing here. And, um, but to the swift situation now, the only way you basically can work around this, and you know, I deal a lot of uh, with finances around the world. The uh, the the way I, I believe I said that before is the way you would have to do this is to go through a country which can receive swift payments on one end, which would be China, and then still has regular banking interaction with Russia, which is also China one of the few places. Uh, Turkey probably uh, is could be possibly working, but that is a big question mark. Um, the United Arab Emirates might be another way to do it, but with bank accounts, then in those countries, you have to have a residency and that sort of stuff for $1,000 or $500 a month in payments from, from YouTube, which is a lot of money in Russia. Uh, at the moment, looking at the exchange rate of about what uh, one dollar to sixty rubles, uh, you know it is money. It's probably not the world, but it is money. And then, whenever you don't have any anything, helps what you can get. There's no question about it. And um, in 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 this whole scenario, so you have to really really work this through third countries. That's my experience. This is basically you almost start. You have to start a uh, money laundering operation, you know. And in this case, it wouldn't be money laundering because of criminal activity, but it would be just to to launder the money you legitimately earned by posting videos on YouTube, or if you have other platforms, you know, where you're making money with uh, to to get that money coming back in, and. Um, the lesson learned in this is, and of course, you know, I grew up in our Western world here, is when our politicians, the Western politicians, are very, very quick and, and very fast uh, uh, on the draw with other people's money, just to say this in general. The entire uh, sanctions against Russia in this has cost the Western economy billions, hundreds of billions of dollars. Now, Svetlana, she went to Raiffeisen Bank, which is a German bank, 
And but the Raiffeisen Bank, the consumer branch she physically went to, does no longer belong to Raiffeisen Bank in Germany. They sold this to the Russian for a dollar or for 60 ruble or something like this when the sanctions started. That is now a Russian controlled bank, you know. The intermediary bank she was talking about, which is also Raiffeisen, is still German owned. But they lost, They've, they had to sell this thing for one dollar. Basically, that was the agreement, the same way McDonald's was sold and other European and American companies were sold uh, for that. And the US taxpayers and the European taxpayers, we have to pay for this now. Because the corporations, the multinational corporations are going to do, do a write, write down and that's going to be written off the taxes. So this is lost tax revenue and that tax revenue means either we have to pay it or the government is going to borrow more money, which the U.S. just did. And in turn, that is money we have to pay at one point or another as citizens. And it doesn't make any difference if you're in Europe or in the United States or in Canada or even in Mexico for that matter, is we're paying directly for this stuff, for these sanctions in support of the Ukraine. Now, I said before, is I also watch the Ukrainian YouTubers and they can still get their money, but now the Russian YouTubers are left high and dry, basically, to say this quite frank. If, if this is exactly the way you're, uh, you know, you think you're going to start a revolution in Russia to get rid of Putin is debatable. Uh, we will get to that when we talk about this Wagner thing here. But this is sad. This is really sad to see that people who put a great amount of effort into their videos and producing them to show, you know, the, the beauty of their country, not this political insanity they got, but, you know, the real beauty of the country, people and customs and, and food and stuff like this. Uh, they get now punished in in such a way for something they haven't even caused or have anything to do with in the first place. Now, if I look at Svetlana, she's probably, I would say, in the late 20s, early 30s. Uh, you know, she is probably not going to be someone who's going to pick up a Kalashnikov and is going to run down over from St. Petersburg, where she lives, over to Moscow to blow up the Kremlin. I don't think that this is going to happen. If this is what Western politicians think this is going to accomplish, these sanctions, then uh, then they have really lost touch with reality. Uh, in a lot of ways, our politicians are far from, from any type of, uh, you know, uh, reality when you look at the circus what we got here in the United States and what they're doing over in Europe but uh, just as general this is probably not going to materialize so this brings us now to the next thing to this whole Ukrainian war with the Russians and here we got now the classical situation of what I said earlier is that we're really really in a, such a similar position as what Germany and Austria was in by about 1915, towards the end of 1915, with the French, where this whole thing stalled. The war would move 10 miles west, then it would move 10 miles back east. So it went into France and came back. And then in the end, this was a war of attrition. This is where they were grinding themselves down. We're seeing this now with Bakhmut. Uh, so the Wagner people or the Russians took it in a street fight, basically heavy, heavy losses in this lots of ammunition and, and, and material wasted and everything else. And this gets expensive. This is this is an expensive war. It is very demanding on, on resources on both sides. And now the Ukrainians have launched a counteroffensive. Now, the counteroffensive is probably going to prevail, depends on how much they're going to throw at it, and that's going to throw the Russians or the Wagner people, if they're still there, uh, back into the other side, and so this is going to go forwards and backwards. This entire war, at, at this point, neither the Russians nor the Ukrainians have the upper hand in this from a uh, material point of view, and not so much manpower, I guess they still can draw on on young men or even elderly men uh, to join the war effort there as soldiers. 
But the, the big thing is the financial impact. Now, when we look at the Ukraine, the Ukraine is getting money or weapons in form of loans. And that means that eventually the United States, Canada and Europe, all of these countries are going to tally up all of that weapons and stuff which was delivered to the Ukraine. Every day this war goes on, the Ukraine is going to be further and further indebted to the Western world. <clears throat> this is basically a war fought, fought on credit. And I do not know if the Western world is going to come then to the aid when this thing ever comes to an end, one way or the other. And they're going to say, we're going to forgive you these loans because there's probably no way when this is said and done that the Ukraine can get back on its feet by itself, they have to basically rebuild a lot of infrastructure. And that is going to be very expensive too, to get this whole thing back to a pre-war condition. You know, I mean, larger areas uh, towards Poland, uh, they're not as affected by this, but with the uh, air raids the Russians have conducted, they have knocked out critical infrastructure uh, systems, you know, whether it's power related, you know, or it is uh, railroad related or highway street related, that sort of stuff has suffered quite a bit. And now we know they flooded this, they opened up a dam and, and so the, the whole infrastructure damage is significant. So this has to be paid and then this, the, the, the ammunition and weapons and everything else have to be paid too. Then we have the tremendous losses of human life on both sides. And uh, we're just looking at the Ukraine. The Ukraine is going to find themselves in a very different position than what they were before the war, what comes with a, as a population structure. And that is something, you know, what we saw in Germany after World War I and World War II especially, was that there was a big dent in that age group of men between 20 to 35. There was a huge because of the tremendous losses to German soldiers or the German Wehrmacht had sustained there too in the end and the Russians and everyone else. So there was a huge shortage of uh, men in that age group and that is going to be somewhat similar in the Ukraine as well. How they want to work this out or when this is going to come to peace, uh, I don't know. At this point, I think the war with the way they're uh, dealing with this this whole piecemeal thing. Well, you get them 20 things and then we give you 15 planes and this is not going to cut this. And the same is the way the Russians are basically fumbling around with this thing. You know, yeah, we're going to send them 10 cruise missiles down there or whatever. And we have uh, 150 Turkish drones and 150 Iranian drones and then they fly over there and the other ones fly with the Israeli drones over there. And it is the numbers will prolong this, these small numbers. And I do not know which side is going to come to their senses first to say we need to stop this. That I couldn't tell you. Uh, it would be nice if I had a glass bowl here uh, without a goldfish in it uh, where I can look into and say, well, this is how this is going to go. It's hard to predict. I couldn't tell you this. Trump is convinced that if he were president, he would have told both of them, both sides here to get lost with this whole thing and bring this to an end. Otherwise, he probably would have pulled the trigger and blown the living daylight out of both countries, I guess. So that's the way at least it sounds. Not sure if he would do this or not, but uh, you know, that guy might be more capable than we think we are, where he is. Uh, with Biden... This thing is going to go on forever with the way they're they're piecemealing this whole thing together. Uh, this is just going to be a prolonged loss of human life in the civilian population and in, in terms of soldiers on both sides. That is the great tragedy in this. And neither one of the two sides, understandably the Ukrainians, since they got invaded, they have every right to defend their country. Don't get me wrong, they got every right to defend their country. But uh, the Western world will have to revise and closely look at their plans and armament plans on how they think they're going to achieve this because so far 
this has not been a masterpiece from either side. This is not a, 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 a war military, which is, is just blooming with great military strategy. Uh, we can say this is absolute uh, warfare and the generals really gave the absolute best here. And the defense sector came together and knocked the singer. None of this is existing. Everyone is just piecemealing this together. Everyone is just trying to look as good as possible on social media. But uh, to, to actually get the thing done and over with, it is not there. It's not there on the Russian side and it's not there on the Ukrainian Western European side. It's not there. It's, it's uh, after 15, 18 months of this nonsense, uh, it's, it's just not there. It's, it's not great warfare. It is a, a pitiful, an absolute pitiful uh, military. This is now from the upper leaderships. And it's primarily the Western leadership here, which is uh, not really committed yet to get into this because they're worried about the Russians. If they, it is unpredictable, but if they keep going like this, this can drag out for five to ten years. This is a war which potentially can go on for years and years and years. When World War One started, the uh, military leadership around Kaiser Wilhelm was convinced that they could quickly move in, similar to the way they did this in 1870-71. The problem was the people who fought in 1870-71, by that time, by 1914, were no longer alive. And those were great military leaders. Those were great warriors who went there from the Prussian, you know, army in there and got this done. Uh, by 1914, this was only a massive amount of a military machine you had there the military industrial complex, so to speak, which had grown, which Germany had grown into until 1914. And they were drunk on their own success before the first shot was actually fired. They thought they were already back in Versailles. And this was part of this whole thing, that this went the way it did go. And here we have the same situation where Russia thought that they're going to waltz over the Ukrainians and yet the Ukrainians are fighting and fighting and fighting and uh, putting up the resistance, plus they're getting the aid from the West. In World War I, the United States really beefed up the military production, and so did the United Kingdom. This is not like what we're seeing. This was on a big, big scale, and it was even bigger in World War II. And so this is why World War I and World War II went the way they did and were won the way they were won, was by the com commitment of the countries to get this over with and done with. And this lackluster performance, what we have here from our Western politicians, um, which uh, quite a few of them actually came out of the peace movement, you know, those people, it is amazing that they actually have delivered any type of weapons over there in the first place to the Ukrainians. And, but unless that is significantly changed and, and the numbers drastically improved, uh, uh, increased in terms of weapons, this thing is going to go on forever. Now we're going to take a real good look at this whole scenario now with the Wagner people. Now, if you think about this, we were told by Putin that he sent his troops over to the Ukraine because he was worried about the Ukrainian Nazis. If you know anything about history, then you know that Adolf Hitler's favorite composer was Richard Wagner. So now we have a mercenary group which calls themselves Wagner fighting Ukrainian Nazis. And somehow, or the other thing is, you have to ask yourself, what am I looking at here? Is this the Swan Lake Ballet that, of the deranged, of the mentally retarded, of what Putin has, has orchestrated there? Or, or what is this? What, what is this what I'm looking at? Uh, we, we have a group now, the Wagner Group, 
some of these people are probably what you could classify as classical right-wing Russian nationalists who joined us. Mercenary is usually that type of environment. And they have amassed already 25,000 uh, paid soldiers, 50,000. Within your own country to have a militia in this size, which is not controlled by the military itself, is a very dangerous undertaking. And the only group which could take Putin technically out, which had the means to it and the manpower, is the Wagner groups with the leader, I can't even pronounce his name, because my Russian is not that good. So anyway, this guy could have taken them out, but they made it X amount of miles to Moscow, and they have no air defense. He went there with tanks and stuff like this, and all they had to do was to get the uh, Russian Air Force up in the air, and they would have blown that whole convoy basically out of the socket. So that shows you on how short-lived this moment would have been. The bloodshed would have been on their side. They would have just destroyed that literally. I'm pretty sure that they got enough fighter jets left in and around Moscow, which would have taken that whole column traveling up there on the highway out. Boom, just like that. And uh, I don't think there was much he could have done with them because when once you have a convoy, a military convoy, uh, in movement like this, where the tanks are actually on trucks, 18-wheelers, uh, there's not much mobility and readiness to fight something instantaneously. So you have to basically unmount the tanks of the trucks to get them ready to drive into this. And these tanks, they suck up a lot of diesel. And that requires a tremendous amount of uh, refueling capabilities when you do this kind of stuff. That comes on top of it. You just can't go to the gas station and, and fill up a, a tank, no matter <coughs> a Western tank or a Russian tank, it doesn't really make any difference because they go, uh, you know, through, through hundreds of gallons of fuel power. And, and uh, I mean, I, the Russian Abrams tank, I think has a 500 gallon uh, tank and and it lasts them literally four hours of driving on a highway or three hours driving in the highway or in, in very difficult terrain. So there's not a lot of reach there uh, and you have to constantly refuel these things. So this is not an easy undertaking. Now the political fallout in this, what we're watching now, this is becoming another Moscow soap opera, basically. What we're watching here is, uh, what is Putin going to do? Is he going to let this guy go? He's going to Belarus, and uh, he's going to live there, uh, knowing that he could have taken him out, and the whole scenario. There's more to come in this. The, the revolution is going to come. But it's going to be a group like this, like the Wagner people, who are going to do or start the revolution. My first thought on Saturday was when I got to hear this in the morning when I woke up here since we're a few hours behind, uh, was what would happen, the scenario, if you had other regions in Russia, like in Georgia, that area down there, and uh, they're going to join in into this revolution with the Wagner people. There's probably two, three other regions where this could happen. You would have immediately a destabiliza destabilization in multiple areas of Russia with some form of armed conflict between the regular Russian army and police forces and these rebel rebels, basically, the revolutionaries in this case, the way this is going to go is hard to predict. I, I couldn't tell you. Uh, my feeling would be that they probably going to uh, kill these these revolutionaries. They did it in 1917 with the Tsar people when they took over. But that was a political movement. What we're having here 
is a revolution of armed of a militia. And this brings to mind the uprising and the revolution of 1918 in Germany, which got the Kaiser dethroned and sent to exile in Holland. And that was the German Marine who started to revolt. And that kind of took over and went into several different areas and it spilled over. The Erhard Brigade was one of those, um, and there was a lot of turmoil and, and tension in there in those years in the entire operation or organization consul evolved out of this whole thing when it transpired there from November 1918 until about, <clears throat> I would say, the middle of 1920. That's really when uh, the organization consul started to take more shape. And all the people on the military side who were involved with the Marine Brigade, Erhard, and, and everything that came with it in, in 1918 to 1920, in that time, basically we're all back together in the organization consul. And, and this is something similar what we're seeing here. And uh, the, the likelihood of something like this succeeding with the limited intelligence I have here is, um, I would say it is difficult to, to make a judgment, but I would say they will not succeed, even when they have 25,000 men. They have heavy armory, tanks, cannons, you know, that kind of stuff. But they don't have aircraft. They're lacking the air force in this picture. And that's how you're basically going to knock them out, is with the air force that kind of a activity very quickly. And uh, the Russians have by far enough, the Russian military has enough by far means, enough means to actually come in there uh, with a couple, three, four squadrons, and they're gonna take this thing out in, in a heartbeat, any type of movement. So a direct attack of what they started on Saturday driving towards Moscow may look impressive, but militarily, it would have accomplished anything. It, you would have had just a highway littered with dead soldiers, with dead Wagner people killed by the regular Russian army, or Air Force in this case. Um, if he could, he, he could have, you know, taken Rostov and Don and to barricaded himself in, similar to what the Erhard Brigade did in Berlin in, in 1920, in early 1920, in March of 1920. Was it 19? No, it was 1920. And, uh, you know, and then it would have lasted for whatever Erhard lasted with this brigade, I think a week, so five days or something like this. And then it all disintegrated because they were trying to take over the city government or the government of the Weimar Republic. <clears throat> and uh, there were, you need to sign papers and there's seals involved. And one of the officials of the Weimar Republic simply walked out with the seals and that left Erhard's brigade with no seals to sign any papers, to validate any papers for official business if you're trying to conduct it on the B state's behalf. So, and something like this would happen there too. And then you're going to have them barricaded in, say like in Don, Rostov and Don. And, and then you're going to have the regular Russian army eventually move in and they're going to have street fights and they're going to fight each other. And then the Russian army is probably going to win in the end because they have more supplies than he does, the Wagner people does. That's the reality. How big of a support there is, within the Russian population is hard to say. Um, for the viewers in Russia, um, I would say, especially for the YouTubers, for you, if you watch this and you're concerned about your money, and I know you're probably, uh, um, for some YouTubers, especially the younger ones, 
uh, that's probably one of their main incomes. Um, you, you have to be really creative and you have to look for the solution outside of Russia. But in a country which has still maintained regular economic relations with Russia, anything in the West is basically out of the window for quite some time to come. And uh, as soon as a European or American politician starts talking sanction, that is written in stone. And if you have never experienced this, this is what this looks like. It, we know our politicians because we vote for these people. Uh, I usually don't because I'm a libertarian and we don't get enough people like me together to vote for enough libertarians, then things may would look a little bit different than from what they do. But if you vote Republican, Democrat, or over in Europe and Germany, you vote for the Christian Democrats, for the Green Party, for the Socialists, for the uh, Liberals, and this is what you're going to get. They're going to come up with sanctions and the, they're going to work this through the parliament and then it's, it's going to go in there and then everyone else is out of money one way or the other. Affected us the same way it affected Ukraine, the same way it affected you now in Russia. If you're watching this, I know I do have quite a few people watching my channel in Russia uh, because it is in English and not in Russian, so they can broadcast that over there. There's not a lot of people who can watch it because they don't understand English. But anyway, I thought I'm going to throw this in. Um, like I said, it's, I don't want to sum this up and repeat myself here again. I don't know when I'm going to make another video. We will have to just wait now and see how this is going to further develop. And uh, if the war keeps on going, there's a war of attrition where the front lines only move, say, like 20 miles, 30 miles in either direction, forwards and backwards. I'm not going to report on this constantly because it is what we had in, in World War I with the French, between Germany and France. And... The end, the way it ended then was through a revolution on either side. In this case, it was on the German side. Uh, the, again, and the Wagner people really don't stand a chance to fight the regular Russian military. They're just not enough people and they don't have enough equipment or ammunition to, to do any prolonged fighting in there. They would have to take over ammunition plants and this, that, and the other thing, the whole fuel supply. They would have to get aircraft, which they don't have, uh, you know, to, to combat this and, and anti-aircraft equipment and all of that stuff. And the Russians are well equipped and they are not for this, not at this point. So there won't be a revolution in that sense. And I don't think that Svetlana is going to pick up a Kalashnikov and is going to run around the Red Square trying to kill Putin. I don't think that that's going to happen either. Even if you take 100,000 Svetlanas, that ain't going to do it. Um, so we just have to wait and see uh, a very precarious situation on how this is going to further unfold. This video rather got long, but on the other hand is I haven't really been able to make videos or there wasn't really anything moving enough worthwhile talking about, except that people were dying left, right and center, uh, which is a tragedy in itself. But um, otherwise, militarily, this thing is, is, is an absolute uh, pitiful thing to watch for, 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 for military greatness points of view. Uh, you know, military accomplishment and battle victories that is, um, it's just not there. So and with that, I'm going to leave it. And I wish every one of you a very pleasant July, 4th of July, for those of you who are celebrating it. And we will be checking in here sooner or later, probably a little bit later, unless something happens. You have a good evening.